So there are millions of men who love training and they love good quality meat and they would like to do something about the challenge or the war on meat. They're not. Technical difficulties. So you're one of those men, but what's different about you is that you actually went and built a company that has a beef product. Uh, I'm excited to share the journey of how you've done that because I know there are so many men out there who are inspired and would like to do something uh, in this space, whether it's connecting to more local farmers together or or things around um, your raw milk, sustainable food production, improving soil quality. Like this topic has become much more popular over the last sort of two decades. And it's it's really cool to see you know what you've been able to do there um in Bali. But yeah, I'd love you know start with you know, why did you why did you build Bali forages? Sorry, I just got cut out of audio. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, that last part just got cut out, but um, yeah, I think uh, I had had a, a problem like a lot of us are facing is like where do we find good quality meat? As uh, the world seems to be turning against <laughs> eating um, ruminant animals, and um, we kind of had this problem. Um, exacerbated during covid um where we were based here on a small island in bali um supply chain was always kind of an issue um we originally started our company we were importing beef from new zealand and we quickly realized that wasn't a stable business model as supply chains were disrupted beef prices were getting really expensive um so we looked local um in our community started networking with local farmers um, and kind of building our own um, system here. Um, and it was just kind of like out of a uh, our own itch that we wanted to scratch and get closer to like where our food comes from. Um, so out of that came uh, Bali Forges where we create uh, nose to tail products, um, started with beef jerky. Uh, we do a beef chip, which is like the consistency of a potato chip, but all beef. We do desiccated uh, beef organs, uh, liver, heart, spleen, kidney, pancreas. Um, and then we also do bone bone collagen, where we use bone marrow, ligaments, tendons uh, to create um, a uh, a bone powder uh, out of those. So try to utilize as much of the animal as possible, um, so nothing goes to waste. And um, yeah, we started just kind of. Um, with our network here in Bali, and now we ship all over Indonesia and soon throughout Asia. And has been building the relationships with the farmers to to be able to get the the raw material. Yeah, we were lucky. Uh, my business partner, she's Indonesian, and her sister has originated a farm here called Little Spoon Farm, based in Bali. So she already kind of had a network um, of farmers growing fruits and vegetables. Um, and the beauty of, of Bali farmers is most most smallholder family farms have cattle. So about ninety percent of um, the cattle industry are run by smallholder family farms. Um, so when you when you look at a um, an Indonesian family or Balinese family, they typically use cows as their bank account or their savings account because uh, in these rural communities, sometimes they don't have access to to banking systems. So if they have um, a family expense or want to send one of their children to school, they'll sell one of their cows, uh, which kind of acts as their saving account. So the, the network was already kind of like in place. It was just kind of us getting out, building those relationships. Um, you know, all the cows are already grass fed, grass finished. You don't really get industrial late, industrially raised beef out here on these big feedlots. Um, which is kind of like the beauty of, of Indonesia. Um, and it's kind of like built into the culture. Have you, have you thought about goats or where do goats fit? Cause I know that there were a lot of goats in Munduk. Yeah, actually we're, we're um, researching a, a colostrum project. Uh, so we're 
looking to source um, colostrum from from goats. We haven't looked too much in as far as like making it into meat products. Um, but yeah, I think that's next on our list. There's there's tons of goats here in, in Indonesia. Um, cattle are kind of like a bigger industry, I would say in, in Bali in particular, but throughout Indonesia, goats um, you can find everywhere. Yeah, the I spoke to a couple of farmers. One day I just went for a walk and and one of the local farmers just said, do you want to come have tea? And so I went and sat with him and his wife and son who was maybe two years old and then father was about 70 and he had seven goats but they were just uh they're only for cash as well in the same way economically like the goal was to sell them to java uh in season yeah. for yeah for the ceremonies there so yeah he his dream was to be able to have uh a few more goats another goat house and more land to clean and basically his job was to clear the landowner's land like weed the land effectively and use that to feed his goats and the people with the, the the cattle are they generally like larger landholders or what it like what's the land ownership situation like for micro farming there you'll get you'll get a combination of larger family um that have you know bigger plots of land but i mean you, you'll come across farmers that only have a few ara couple you know 100 you know not even 100 square meters of land that just have a single cow so it varies quite a bit um yeah. the uh in it, uh bali in particular has i think there's roughly 600,000 head of cattle and the government's trying to bring that number up to over a million um so where we are in the south um just up the coast there's a large breeding program um where they're um, artificially inseminating the cattle. And then they have a government program that will gift the farmers um, the, the cows yep. uh, to breed. And then after they breed, or I think they have three calves, then they're allowed to, to slaughter the animal before, before they, they can um, sell it on. So the, the goal is to just you know, keep breeding, keep the, the herd numbers up. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I think um, what what these smallholder farmers also have trouble. You know, it, it's a very localized economy, and what Bali Forge just kind of brings to the table is able to like scale um, these smallholder family farms, right? Because we bring just taking our products to market and able to export, we're able to add so much more value in, in secondary processing creating shelf stable products like beef jerky, for example, it's like six months to seven month shelf life. And then the desiccated beef organs are up to two years. Um, and we're able to add, I think almost eight X value of what they would sell at, at market rate. Um, so we're, we're purchasing the cattle for above market market rate from these farmers. Um, once they meet our standards. Um, so I think that's like, one thing that modern technology and e-commerce and social media marketing companies can can add value to some more of some of these rural farmers that have great products, um, but they don't have access to larger markets. So I think there's opportunities for other companies to kind of model what we're doing, um, and and add value to to some of these great you know farms that are that are out there. So you went from wanting to solve your own desire for some beef jerky and and selling it to a few friends and and whatnot right. to to where you are now what have been the biggest lessons so far to get to this point uh, i think it's just been a lot of patience um you deal as you scale you deal like with a lot of a lot more bureaucracy and as a foreigner living in in indonesia it's, uh it's not as easy to to navigate it's not as um black and white there's not like that many um paths that you can like mimic and you kind of have to kind of like burn your or you know pave your own trail um so just navigating um different regulations around beef in particular uh that that's been the the biggest struggle um it took us nearly two years to get our uh bee palm license which is like the equivalent of the fda food and drug administration in, in indonesia they have their own regulatory system for food and supplements here. Um, so just going through that process was just 
you know, big waiting game because um, we had big purchase orders coming from Hong Kong and and Singapore that we we couldn't deliver because you know we didn't have our licensing and it was just like you know that carrot dangling in front of us and we couldn't reach it because we you know it was just a waiting game of just getting all of our paperwork and just dealing with all all the different uh, government offices and stuff was a challenge um but i i think now that that we are able to navigate those waters it's it's a lot easier for us to launch product um so that was kind of just having the patience to to deal to deal with that was uh was cha- challenging in, in itself when did that come through that was just the beginning of this year uh we had our our own production facility built built out we renovated a building um and uh yeah just went through our final ex- inspections um started this year um and yeah rolled out our our um palm license on our on all of our products which was like a, a huge milestone for us yep so now you have the ability to distribute through asia maybe because most people listening to this probably aren't going to be in in asia what's the story with uh, further exporting further abroad yeah so beef does have um a little bit uh more hurdles than other products just because of you know the historic um, of like having mad cow disease, essentially, I don't, Indonesia's never had, I think, a case of mad cow. But um, I think it does come down more to politics on uh, different trade agreements between countries. Um, all of uh, the Asian countries like have their own trade agreements here, so it's it's easier for us to export to say Singapore than you know Australia or, or the U.S. Um, so we are developing other products. We do we do have an oyster product, which is just freeze dried oyster flesh that we capsule um, powder. So it's a great source of zinc, other micronutrients. We're also launching a, a chicken chip product. So it's similar to our beef chip um, consistency of a potato chip, but uh, um, just like pure protein, no added uh, fillers or or um, preservatives. Um, so we're kind of trying to diver, diver, diversify our product line, um, to kind of like hedge against like countries that we can't export to. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's such a demand in Asian and Indonesian itself is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So I think we have a big enough marketplace here to, to be set, but, um, I think Singapore and, and Hong Kong will be the next markets for us. Yeah, I I think you know the first thing that comes up when you're talking about some of these unique products is like you know how do I get some and it's that's that's why that question needs to be asked even though I'm sure it's big enough markets there to have a good business like guys in Australia or uh, America would want to see these products on the shelves and eventually the better your company does and the better you know, other other similar companies are doing the more these things will expand like it's about the the profitability of it the demand for it the political will for it increases with the public demand for it as well like if there's more people asking for it then it's it's going to be harder to hold hold it back um, right and i think that that's something that we can think of long term because if you've seen the way these cattle are raised like they in my opinion they're they're some of the happiest cows you can imagine they're they're sunning on overlooking the water grazing on grass like just living their best life so it, it's it doesn't get much better than that like um if we're able to show that you know that these cows are well maintained and and coming from great farms like uh, i wouldn't see why there would be any issue exporting but um i think we'll just keep keep doing what we're doing and um if there's demand and uh, in other countries we'll, we'll we'll try to provide it so what are the what are the big next steps? You've got the license now. You've got production. You've got you know, the wholesale in place. The no, local network. What yeah, it's are you just, excited about uh, next. Yeah, building um just di- distribution channels. Um, so we've been we've been uh, networking with some distributors in Singapore, uh, getting in some some of the larger uh, supermarkets there. Um, some people that have already set up like e-commerce sites um, that have like a a network already set up that are you know uh selling similar healthcare like products um 
And then um, we're also expanding our, our sales team in Jakarta because right now our, all of our distribution is coming from, from Bali, um, which is relatively small. I think it's only 4% of the population and like 40% of the populations in, in Java, Jakarta. Um, so yeah, just setting up teams there, um, getting more of a, a, a presence. Um, but Bali's been great because you know most domestic travel, they come to, to Bali on holiday and Bali Forge is in most of major supermarkets here. So they're, we have great brand awareness already. We also sell on Tokopedia, which is the equivalent of Amazon for Indonesia. Um, so we'll be setting up just distribution centers in Jakarta so they can have same day delivery. Um, so yeah, that's kind of more, more just distribution, setting up ch channels for um, easy ordering access. Yep. Very cool. So yeah, the getting, getting product into the supermarkets uh, do they? what sort of purchase orders do they go with to kind of, how much do they, ha how much volume of product do they have to expect to sell to want to stock the chips, the different products? I think it needed there. I think you just muted out there. I'm not sure what happened. All right. Sorry. Is that back? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So we do um, just wholesale with minimum orders. Um, we avoid doing any consignment um, just, just because it, we didn't have a big enough team to manage inventory. Um, so we push for wholesale um, and then it's just kind of up to us to negotiate payment terms. Um, most of them want like 30 day. We try to do, you know, either payment on delivery up to 30 days. Um, but uh, yeah, cause that was actually becoming an issue for us was like cash flow, right? Some of these larger grocery stores were putting in big purchase orders and then paying, you know, 30 days later or potentially being late on payments. Um, yeah. So yeah, we did hire an accounting team just to manage our accounts receivable. Um, cause at one point earlier in the year, it was like, accounts receivable is getting pretty, pretty large. And we're like, Oh crap, we might, uh, you know, this might be an issue, a cash flow issue. Yeah. So just, just managing, managing, managing cash is obviously cash is king with, with, um, with any company. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we got stocked in the airport actually earlier this year, which has been huge. Uh, the Bali airport has tons of traffic. Uh, and you know, when you go to these, some of these little, snack supermarkets in the in the um in the uh, airports it's just junk food right yeah and the first thing i look for is like a, a healthy high protein snack and if there's not beef jerky i'm not really purchasing anything um so yeah i think the the airport is probably one of our our largest uh, wholesalers right now yeah generally a lot of the jerkies have too much crap in them as well like there's in australia there's like two or three brands that i'll eat and then it's maybe six or eight that i won't so it depends like certain supermarkets i'll uh, certain gas stations i'll go to a certain brand of gas station because i know they stock that kind of uh meat snacks yeah exactly yeah you'll you'll look at the pack and it's like oh my gosh there's like 30 40 grams of sugar yeah and like other ingredients i can't read <laughs> yeah 100 percent. what's the little gym that you're in there i see the uh the dip bars in the yeah. background yeah I'm, uh this is at oh, yeah. uh bam Bamboo Fitness in yeah, uh, Uluwatu. Yeah. They have nice. like a little outdoor gym here. Yeah. There's a Did bunch you... of cows in the back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. Did you just yeah, train good... there? You just train there now or are you about to after? Yeah, my uh, my buddy Will, he owns this place. They, they opened up almost a year ago. Uh, he's from the U.S. as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we just did like a little, little training session and popped on here for podcasts. Very cool. Uh, so can you share a bit about your team and how it's been building a team around this? Is it, uh, Am I correct in saying that you sort of started this yourself? Is it your own initiative or? Um, yeah, I mean, I had the idea, but um, I'm, I'm definitely not doing it alone. Um, no. So this started during COVID. Um, and 
luckily I, so I've done other startups before in, in tech. Uh, so nothing related. Um, so I've, I've had experience building teams and, um, and having co-founders. And so, you know, I had that, um, you know, experience of the do's and don'ts of building a team. Um, but yeah, we were actually, we were working on another project together. Um, we were doing like a, uh, a farm resort. I think we talked about this before. Yeah. Yeah. But they, um, we were developing a land on a river with a regenerative farm, um, that my business partner, her sister was, you know, building, uh, with little spoon. And it was the, the concept of having, you know, all of your food, uh, there on sites, you would have wellness center and then accommodation. Um, and we were raising money for that project. Um, and then COVID hit, and it was just really difficult to get off the ground. Um, and then during that time, I was just kind of like making beef jerky in my, my kitchen oven at home, uh, during lockdown. Um, cause I go on spearfishing trips and hiking trips all over Bali and Indonesia. And so always looking for like healthy snacks. Um, and, uh, my business partner, we were living, we were housemates at the time as well. He had a really good beef jerky recipe and, uh, mess, messing around with a few different, um, products that are testing different jerky recipes and, uh, started posting them on uh, my Instagram and all my buddies were like reaching out to me were like, Hey, can I get some jerky? Cause you can't find any good beef jerky in Bali. And, uh, just started getting like more and more messages and the light bulb kind of went off. It's like, Hey, maybe we can just like start selling this at the gyms and to our, to our network here in, in Bali. And, uh, kind of just spread word of mouth like that. Um, and I have kind of more of a marketing background. Um, uh, my business partner has like an operations, um, he worked in hospitality. So he's, he's great at, uh, building teams as well. Um, and then, yeah, we just started, expanding and selling to all the local gyms, some of the the smaller markets here in Bali. And then we brought in our other business partner. Her name's Aurelia and she's, she's, uh, Indonesian, uh, went to school in the U S and is also great at, at, uh, just team building. And she, she kind of had, you know, more of a, an insight on the local market, uh, being Indonesian. Um, and I, I would say six months, to about a year ago, we, we kind of pivoted our content from mostly Eng English to uh, transitioning to, to Indonesian. And that's where we saw like our numbers really spike up and, and really get like penetrate the Indonesian market. And that was yeah. kind of our goal. You, you're kind of capped out on the, the local expat market here in, in Bali. You can only grow so big. And uh, the ultimate goal was to penetrate Jakarta. Um, and once we started kind of like educating and our transitioning our content to Indonesian and, and taking those kind of concepts that you're, you're hearing in the West, like nose to tail eating and, and micronutrient density and food, um, transitioning that to Indonesian. Yeah. That really clicked with everybody. So, um, I think that was like the, a, a big, uh, pivotal moment for us. Yes. And you've been in, in expanding again with the team recently how how's it felt to you know take that next step it's always a challenge as a business owner of how much you invest in the future back the future growth versus you know re remaining profitable and uh, not over leveraging how's how's that decision been and process so far yeah i think um the the biggest challenge like as you grow is trying not to micromanage um, I think, uh, that was my misstep in my first business is trying to micromanage everything and be involved in, in too many things. Um, you, you, you have to let go control it at some stage. Um, I think as a, as a founder, you can be clear on your vision and, and have those values set and like set the tone for the team and let them run with it. Um, which is a big, it's, it's hard because it's like your baby, right? And then you have to put it out in the world and let your team run with it. Um, so that was, that's always a big challenge just to like, let go of, of control, not try to micromanage everybody. Um, and, uh, I think learning that early on, it, it helps you as a, as a founder, grow your team. Um, and it gives them, you know, 
your team confidence to, to grow with the company. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's always the biggest, biggest challenge I, I've, I've found. <laughs> yeah. But it's also a really cool feeling when things are going well and you see things expand or someone does something great, that's going to make a difference in the company and you didn't have to do it. Right. Yeah, exactly. I know when you, when you have one of your sales team, like bring in a new big account and you're like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. Like she's like replicating everything that we're doing and, and they're, they see the big picture. They're they're getting the messaging across, and, and and you know you're you're doing your job as as kind of like the director, the orchestrator, um, when when your team's like closing deals and and getting the message across. I know you've had a is the real estate project that you've had there on that farm land that you that you were talking about before. It's become a more of a residential project or is the farm is separate to that? So yeah, the farm is still going on. Um, I ended up uh, getting my own piece of land uh, during, during COVID um, and I'm developing uh, a project with, with another business partner. Um, he, he's a builder contractor here. Um, so we, yeah, we just sold the first villa. We're building um, around six, six villas on the river. Just um, outside of Changu, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the area. It's like south, uh, southeast, or sorry, southwest Bali. Um, but yeah, that that will be yeah, that's separate from from Bali Forges, just like a different project. Yeah. Do you have any other projects that you're working on or thinking about, or is the main focus is uh, the Bali Forges expansion into Asia? Yeah, I think as far as um, just securing our, our supply chains, um, so our oysters is actually one of our best sellers. So we're in the process of either, uh, we want to either acquire our own oyster farm, uh, ideally just uh, buy or partner with an existing oyster farm here, um, just so we have secure supply. So we're going, going through over, I think, 500 kilos of oysters a month. So it's like, it's quite a bit of volume of, of oysters. And we just want to make sure that that, that supply stays consistent. Um, and we'll be doing that, the same thing with, with our, with our cattle. Um, I think we go through about 35 head of cattle a month. Um, so we're just thinking long-term trying to start our own herd or kind of bring in the farmers into a, a Bali Forges cooperative, um, just so we can secure supply chain. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's basically about just securing supply chain and, and, and making sure that we can, we, we can grow. Yep. So for those in Singapore and Hong Kong or around Asia, if they want to have these products in their gym or, uh, help connect small stores, health food stores with the product, what's the best way to go about that? Um, yeah, I think just reaching out to us um, right now, we we can ship direct to consumer um, to Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, and then, yeah, we can just, they can connect with one of our, our sales team and we can, um, yeah, set up, set up dialogue to start distribution. How many countries do you have direct shipping to now? Um, well, I mean, we have shipped to Europe before. It does get quite expensive, but I mean, it seems like people are willing, they, they love our products. So they're like willing to pay. Um, but right now it's like, it's the most convenient to ship to Singapore just because of, um, geographical location. Um, but we've, we've shipped to Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Dubai, um, yeah, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia and South Korea. Yeah, it's just it's a matter of just like setting up distribution. We're like just getting started with this. It's it's kind of early days because uh, we've been so focused on Indonesia. But um, yeah, happy to connect with anybody that has has that network and, and import export expertise. And do you do you want to discuss the uh, investment opportunity there, or should we just leave it at people can reach out if they're interested in? You know, um... Yeah, let's Looking just at the let's opportunity just, to get involved. Yeah, they can reach out. Um, maybe we'll talk about that privately, but um, yeah, happy to 
happy to discuss any of that as well as we expand. Excellent. Is there anything else you wanted to share or anything we missed there that kind of people should know about what you're up to there? Um, no, I think, I think that covers it. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, setting up distribution, securing supply chain kind of is our biggest, our next steps. Um, we'll be launching a few, few other products, um, all, all same kind of nose to tail based, um, whole food nutrition. We don't plan to get on uh, into like any synthetic supplements. There's been opportunities to get into that, but uh, I think we want to kind of stay true to our values and, um, stick with yeah whole food nutrition and specialty food products maybe we can go back to the start just for the last five minutes a bit of your your background we went straight into barley forages and what you've been doing there i think your your backstory is also part of why people might want to support and get involved with with what you're doing um do you want to share a bit about your your, you know your sporting background where you grew up and, and those kinds of things yeah, sure. Yeah, so I grew up in, in the U.S. in Southern California. I uh, grew up playing football, American football and, and baseball, played baseball in college. Um, and was trying to kind of go, I mean, the, the end goal was to become a professional athlete and uh, life had other plans. Um, I had a really bad um, parathyroid issue. Uh, I was in the hospital for a few months, um, had a massive tumor on my parathyroid. Uh, lost a bunch of weight and just kind of set me back and kind of put life into perspective on what I wanted to prioritize. And um, I think that that medical issue also gave me the urge to to go and see the world and never be complacent and um, went on a few trips after that and experienced some foreign foreign lands and got got the itch going to just explore as much as I could. Um, finished university and went straight into finance uh, not what I was expecting and I was like what am I doing here like I cannot sit behind a desk like did that for three years and you know in the back of my mind it was like the equivalent of being in a hospital bed I was like dying in this office job <laughs> uh, I paid well but I was like I can't I can't do this I'm not I'm not gonna survive um so ended up just selling everything and bought a one-way ticket to Bali in 2014 um, and just decided to take like a gap year to figure out what the next steps were and um, instantly started like working with a health and wellness retreat that was based here in, in Bali and worked with them doing business development and helped them expand to um, South Africa, Guatemala, uh, New Zealand, Iceland, and, and more retreats in Bali. Um, and uh, yeah, just worked with them um, and then developed a, a technology company that we um, were launching during COVID. It was, a, it was a tourism and content creation platform that we were launching with a bunch of the, uh, the large beach clubs and, and tourism board here in Indonesia. And COVID hit and just shut down the whole project. So I was like, all right, well, what do we, what do we do now? So, um, yeah. And then just kind of stumbled upon Bali forges. I was like always into health and nutrition and knowing where my food comes from. I'm a big spear fisherman. I spear fish out here like once a week. Um, so I've, I'm really into like knowing exactly where, um, my food source is coming from. Um, so I think Bali forges kind of falls in line with my personal ethos and, and brand and, it's just, uh, yeah, kind of snowballed from there. I, uh, I dabble in a lot of things. It's just uh, kind of part of my nature. Um, yeah, always, always ex- uh, up for exploration and expanding my own, um, you know, worldviews and, and challenging myself. It's always been kind of like what, what keeps me going. The real estate side of things has been an interest as well, right? Like your real estate uh, development, understanding land, and yeah, I um, it's uh, I, I come from a a background like my my dad was a developer in in the U.S. Um, kind of always dabbled in that, um, and uh, have a a great network of of people that have already built properties here, um, and dur- during COVID there was 
some great deals on land and it was uh, an opportunity to, to get involved on a project. Um, and I'm able to kind of use my background in branding and marketing and, and provide um, um, to that project. And yeah, we just sold uh, two villas off plan of the of the seven. So we're just yeah getting breaking ground uh, next month. That's exciting. I don't know if guys here had any questions. You can always uh, put your hand up or uh, um, use the chat in any of these conversations. But did anyone have anything they wanted to? Daniel looks like you've yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how big is the company uh, we're talking about? Uh, the team is around 30 right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we you started guests. it on your own and then grew it all the way to 30? Correct, yeah. Yeah, we just, uh, we literally started in our kitchen oven doing, uh, yeah. I, I just had one of those Instagram memories pop up on, on my phone and I was like, oh my gosh, we just literally started in our oven and I had a video <laughs> of the, delivering our first dehydrator to our villa because we are like, we can't can't keep cooking this in our oven and we just got like one of those 30 sheet you know small dehydrators and we were huh. yeah, transitioning to that and that was like our first big big purchase as a company <laughs> like a hundred dollar dehydrator <laughs> yeah that's cool and and was it is it still a uh, u.s company or is it all uh, indonesian based now no it's yeah all indonesian yeah we we launched uh, in okay. bali and, and was it hard out. to get registered and uh, get all that going? Um, as far as like business registration and all that, no. Uh, it was more just the regu regulations uh, around uh, the beef and the, the whole food supplements. Um, okay. The regulatory, I would say, is even more strict than the FDA when it comes to uh, hmm. supplement or whole food supplements. Okay, cool. Yeah. So no downsides because you're you're a foreigner. No, no. Okay. That that's not an issue. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, I operate under a uh, investor kitas, which uh, is a two year, um, uh, like working visa. So that just gets um, mm. registered every two years. And then you need to like uh, renew it. Um, every yeah. Um, yeah minimal fee yeah okay and like your your residency um can you can you stay because you have your business registered as well correct yeah the the they call it a kitas or an investor kitas okay. that gives me residency yeah permanently not permanent no oh uh, there so are for two years yeah two years you can do you can do other visas and stuff, but this just gives me the ability to work. Okay. Garrett good. was asking about Garrett was asking about financing, uh, franchising there. And the, this is the question that I had with you as well. Like, you know, where, okay. what's the path into Australia or into America? Are they, he, he, yeah, he's asking about franchising. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it all comes down to the supply, right? Um, you want to secure like where the where the, the the raw material is coming from first. Know the farmers, um, but yeah, our our team's really good at uh, building systems, and um, so I think that if we were to like franchise, we'd we want to oversee some of the, some of those systems as part as like manufacturing goes, just to keep a high standard. What Garrett's asking, have you heard of Craig Judy, cattle farmer in America? What's the... uh, I have... but, um, I don't know if you have you guys heard of um Epic Provisions or Epic Bar? Yeah, I've seen the Epic Bars. They're, they're pretty good. Yeah. So they 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 came out with the range of nose to tail products um and uh other products besides beef. I think they do pork, uh bison, chicken. Um, but they were bought out by General Mills, I think, a few years back. So I think that's kind of like our path that we want to follow is um, scale to 
um, something to that size um, where we launched a lot of animal-based products. Yeah, a lot of this stuff has fruit in it, which is like good and bad, but not ev- not everybody wants dried fruit in their meat products. Yeah, true. Or, or maple, but they're, they're tasty. They're, it's a good good company, good brand, but yeah, I like, I I like they, what you guys are doing. Yeah, they were using a lot of yeah, regenerative agriculture. I think White Oak Pastures was one of their suppliers. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Very good. All right, well, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing the, the journey here. Michael, I think there's a number of levels that people can get some benefit from this, you know, thinking about for their own business and aspirations, what they really want to achieve and how just taking that next step of, oh, okay, I'm selling, I'm, I want to sell, I'm making jerky for myself. I'm going to sell it to some friends, uh, how that can escalate. And there's a lot of lessons here around building a team and working with, with others and being patient through the process. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't instantly profitable, but you've, you know, got to a point where you've now got, significant team and there's opportunity to to expand internationally so uh yeah i hope others draw inspiration from that and maybe there's also some you know possibilities of people who can connect in terms of adding value to this business or supporting the distribution i'm going to send this video to some of the guys in hong kong and singapore and and see you know what their interest is in either wholesaling it or uh, potentially supporting on the ground to, to get the word out a bit more about barley forages. Yeah. Amazing. Keegan. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. And if anybody's like wanting to start something, um, wants some just like feedback on the product or anything like that. Oh, I'm like happy to answer questions. Um, I think the biggest thing is just like, it sounds so cliche, but it's like, you got to get something out there. Getting feedback is like going to be your, your best ally. Um, and if you're wanting to perfect everything before you release it, you're probably too late. Uh, I think that's where I stumbled on my first startup is like, just, just get it out there and people will like it or don't. And then you iterate and make improvements and get it back out there. Just gotta, yeah. Keep moving. hundred percent. That goes for every, every product, digital, physical. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Appreciate your time. And, uh, yeah, that, Bamboo fitness looks looks really cool. I, I knew about it. And you mentioned it before, but I haven't seen it uh, up close like that. So yeah, nice. next time you're up. Yeah, we'll have to get train. a session there. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Thanks, brother. Have a great right. rest of the day. We we'll speak soon. Bye. Bye, bye.